Okay, uh, video's on. Okay, so hemorrhagic stroke. Now, hemorrhagic stroke is gonna be very similar treatment and signs and symptoms and all that for a, as a head injury, okay? So, uh, we have ICH, intracranial hemorrhage, we have subdural hematoma uh, or hemorrhagic stroke. So all of those things are, this, are basically the same as far as treatment. Uh, you do have subtle things based on where the bleed is in the brain, but as far as nursing is concerned, all we care about is that it's a bleed in the brain, okay? Now, if you think about the brain box and you think about the blood and the brain tissue, do they touch? Yeah. Remember the brain blood barrier? No, they don't touch, right? No. no, your your brain is not bathed in blood. No. Only CSF. Okay, right. only CSF. So when the brain gets blood on it, so here we have a brain. Okay, and uh, till now. Can you hear Sorry, I know it's just so There's a brain. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not an artist. Okay. So up until now, your brain has had this beautiful, clear, wonderful, smooth CSF that it's been living in, and it's just been wonderful, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, something icky is touching my brain. It's touching me. It's touching me. And the brain totally gets irritated. Like, I don't want that near me. It's touching me. And so the brain gets really irritable which tells us we have risk for seizures, um, that it's really bad, because they don't have that kind of stuff with um, an ischemic stroke. Uh, so depending upon where in the brain, if it's intracerebral versus um, subdural, which is more like that, which one do you think is worse? Intracerebral. Intracerebral, and it's largely because of the treatment. So what is the treatment for intracerebral hemorrhage? Surgery. Surgery. The only way to cure an intracerebral hemorrhage is to go in there and get the blood out. So not only do we have now, so you've had a blood vessel, and the oxygen and everything has been just traveling along nicely, right? And now you have a break in it somewhere, um, either because uh, very commonly high blood pressure, hypertensive crisis, and then something pops, very common, or an aneurysm where you have a weak spot, and the, um, so you just have, you, it's intact, but it's weak, and so the blood's gonna go path of least resistance, and so now you're, you've like made your own little tunnel, which is very, very weak, and it will end up popping. And you're gonna have less blood. So it's still lack of blood flow to part of the brain and brain cells die. That part is the same. That's what makes it a stroke, just like the ischemic stroke. And your symptoms look very similar. Um, the thing that makes a bleed very uh, different as far as symptoms would be the sudden severe, worst headache of my life. Okay, so just as in an MI, it's an elephant on my chest, for a brain bleed, it's the worst headache of my life. And then usually they go down at some point, you know, soon. Um, okay, so <clears throat> you have a lack of blood flow to part of your brain and, and it dies. So then it looks like a stroke. So it's the same thing, the act fast is gonna be the same. Okay, but it's harder to treat. So who would go in and do surgery on a patient with a, a blood in their brain? A neurosurgeon. So when you're the nurse, you know you need a neurosurgeon if you have a brain bleed, okay? What does a neurologist do? They study. They do study, but they do treat. Um, a neur neurologist. Oh, they give you meds. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. with uh, neuro 
diseases like yeah. MS or right. So they're going to treat neuropathology. Um, they're going to treat seizure disorders. They're going to treat things medically, non-surgically. Okay. So if you call a neurologist with a brain bleed, they're not going to help you very much because that's not their specialty. You need a neurosurgeon. Okay. Um, if somebody puts a ventric in, it's going to be a neurosurgeon. You might have a neurologist later down the road during recovery for meds and stuff, mm -hmm. but what you really want is the neurosurgeon, and they are gonna manage the drugs and everything until the patient is um, at a point where they're no longer considered acute, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> okay, so these are the common um, causes of the brain bleed, okay? Aneurysm, um, high blood pressure, uh, might be a genetic thing. Um, they might have AV malformation. Okay, um, so those are some causes of the brain bleed. If they have like a subdural hematoma or something uh, epidural, it's gonna be easier, it's gonna be more like a big clot and they're gonna say they've evacuated the hematoma. That's kind of what the surgery would be. Um, a crany with evacuation of whatever kind of hematoma they have. So basically just taking the clot out. Uh, but if it's in the middle of your brain, they're gonna have to go through parts of your brain to get to the affected area. And so whatever they go through, they're gonna damage. And so you're gonna potentially have neuro deficits. So people aren't always the same after a crany or they need to relearn how to say the alphabet or you know whatever part of their brain was damaged, that's the part that they're gonna have to rehab. <coughs> Okay, so <clears throat> brain bleed, we're thinking surgery. Absolutely no anticoagulants or thrombolytics. Okay. No, no, no. Um, we are worried about ICP. So ischemic stroke, it's a clot and it's kind of finite. With a bleed, you, you can potentially keep bleeding. And if the stroke is getting worse in front of you, the brain is bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Not only is the brain irritable because blood is touching it, it's taking up space, mm -hmm. right? So it's causing increased pressure. It's pushing on the brain, potentially damaging those cells mm -hmm. and releasing toxins and stuff that damages the brain cells. Um, the brain is irritable because the blood is touching it. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's not a good situation when it's acute. Um, so what test are we going to do for a uh, CT? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, you're going to do a CT and see if there's a bleed. And then you're going to get a neurosurgical consult to come and look and see if it's surgical. So they can either take them for a crany, and sometimes they'll put, they'll just poke holes in the head, um, like to relieve pressure. They call them burr holes. Or they can go in and they can actually um, cut and they can remove the clot. Um, sometimes they'll come out with a JP drain from their brain mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> to uh, alleviate swelling. Or they can have a ventriculostomy. So with a ventric, it's a tube that goes inside your brain. So if we have a brain box with a brain in it, and your ventricles are here, they're going to put this catheter, they're gonna drill a hole. Um, I like to show a video in my class, but you can YouTube um, putting an ICP in, okay? Uh, it's all by feel. So the doctor is gonna either drill, um, it looks like, a, I've seen them at Michael's. It looks like one of those drills, that, the crank or they're gonna use this kind of a drill, like a hand one, and they'll feel it when they're in the ventricle. And then they'll come back out and there's brain tissue on the drill. I mean, how do you get through the brain without, yeah. Um, and there's no pain receptors on your brain. So I have done this with the patient totally awake, and it's kind of freaky. 
and um, you hold the head and the patient's just looking around and like, oh my God, stop looking at me, right? Um, and the doctors over there, they shave and then they iodine. Okay, um, like, wait, no chlorhexidine <laughs> on your head. No, no chlorhexidine on your head. It's, it's neurotoxic. No, no chlorhexidine that. on your head. Um, so they use iodine and they bathe it with iodine and then they're going to make a little incision to get to the skull and then they're gonna drill through the skull. And the patient's just... And then they're gonna put a little, pla it looks like a, um, like a central line almost and it's called a Scott cannula and they put it into that hole, into the ventricle and then they're gonna allow some of that CSF to drain because they only put it in because you have a high pressure, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's bloody, sometimes it's just clear CSF. Uh, and then the nurse is gonna have the pressure system that we can talk about next week uh, to allow for drainage, and, which is a very dangerous thing. So we, we have special classes and you know you have a competency check off and all that. But there's a, a system that you have to prepare ahead of time and you plug that into the catheter and then you dress it and, um, and then you start monitoring, okay? So the ventriculostomy monitors and drains. <clears throat> I like when you sum up the purpose of things. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I could read you the book, but it would be kind of boring. Okay, so um, so it monitors and drains, and so um, you could have any host of orders. You could have keep open to drain. And the way the system is set up, you set it for like 10, mm -hmm. and then if, it, if the ICP goes above that level, then it will drain. It's set up that, you know, it's leveled and everything. We'll talk about that next week. <clears throat> um, or they'll say drain when the ICP goes above 15. So you're monitoring the ICP all the time, and if it goes above 15, you go in the room, you drain it, you watch everything, you close it, and you document the drainage. Um, or you could just have it clamped. So the patient we currently have, it's clamped because they're trying to DC it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you clamp this, this the um, ventriculostomy in the hopes that you can DC it, because you can't have it forever, uh, if they cannot DC it because the drainage just continues, the pressure stays up, that's when the patient gets a VP shunt. And they put in a tube from the ventricles and down into your abdomen, and then you can now drain CSF into your abdomen and then it gets absorbed, so it's more like a natural thing. Very commonly, those VP shunts get clogged up, they get infected, they have to be revised. If it's a kid that's getting it, as they get older, they have to have bigger, newer ones put in because they're growing. So, um, so the VP shunt thing is a little bit down the road, but it comes usually from an ICP that just, um, they don't start draining on their own. I remember that yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Good. yeah. Okay, so um, you can have any host of orders, but um, we w our ICP generally zero to fifteen, and it's going to vary by book. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, this is the higher pressure, and it should not be less than zero because that would mean your ventricles have collapsed, or more likely, your system has a flaw in it and you have to change your tubing or something, okay? Um, so zero to 15, and in the next video, we'll go over the uh, interventions.